seems like it was only a few days ago that we were together, but you know, it's come, our next meeting is coming up fast. July the 12th, 12 noon, we're all going to meet right here at Wynn First Assembly of God. We're going to, I've requested that we use the, the uh, gymnasium, and uh, it's got more room. It seems like we have more fun when we got more room and we spread out. But anyway, July the 12th at noon, and I'm asking you this time, bring a crock pot. Let's do it in the crock pot. It's easier. And I know everybody's got their favorite crock pot recipes. I'm going to bring mine. You bring yours. And we're going to call it crock pot luck. Pot luck in a crock pot. Crock pot luck. Sounds like a good name to me. See you July the 12th, 12 noon here at Win First Assembly in the uh, gymnasium. And bring your favorite crock pot lunch. And we're just going to have a we're going to eat, and we're going to have a wonderful time. And pray for us. There's a possibility we're going to have a special speaker. Okay? We're working on it, and uh, I, believe, I believe it'll happen. Love you. See you there. Let's have a great time. Amen. Hey church, it's Connor here with the Austin Drama Team. Listen guys, we're so excited to be with y'all on July 15th, 7 p.m. It's only one night, but we know that God is going to do something amazing. So make plans to come because believe me, you don't want to miss it. meeting is coming up fast. July the 12th, 12 noon, we're all going to meet right here at Wynn First Assembly of God. We're going to, I've requested that we use the, the uh, gymnasium and uh, it's got more room. It seems like we have more fun when we got more room and we spread out. But anyway, July the 12th at noon, and I'm asking you this time, bring a crock pot. Let's do it in the crock pot. It's easier. And I know everybody's got their favorite crock pot recipes. I'm going to bring mine. You bring yours. And we're going to call it crock pot luck. Pot luck in a crock pot. Crock pot luck. Sounds like a good name to me. See you July the 12th, 12 noon here at Win First Assembly in the uh, gymnasium. And bring your favorite crock pot lunch. And we're just going to have a, we're going to eat and we're going to have a wonderful time. And Pray for us. There's a possibility we're going to have a special speaker. Okay? We're working on it, and uh, I, believe, I believe it'll happen. Love you. See you there. Let's have a great time. Amen. Hey, church. It's Connor here with the Austin Drama Team. Listen, guys, we're so excited to be with you all on July 15th, 7 p.m., it's only one night, but we know that God is going to do something amazing. So make plans to come because believe me, you don't want to miss it. coming up fast. July the 12th, 12 noon, we're all going to meet right here at Win First Assembly of God. We're going to, I've requested that we use the, the uh, gymnasium and uh, it's got more room. It seems like we have more fun when we got more room and we spread out. But anyway, 
July the 12th at noon. And I'm asking you this time, bring a crock pot. Let's do it in a crock pot. It's easier. And I know everybody's got their favorite crock pot recipes. I'm going to bring mine. You bring yours. And we're going to call it crock pot luck. Pot luck in a crock pot. Crock pot luck. Sounds like a good name to me. See you July the 12th, 12 noon here at Wind First Assembly in the uh, gymnasium and bring your favorite crock pot lunch. And we're just going to have a, we're going to eat and we're going to have a wonderful time. And pray for us. There's a possibility we're going to have a special speaker. Okay? We're working on it and uh, I, believe, I believe it'll happen. Love you. See you there. Let's have a great time. Amen. Hey church, it's Connor here with the Austin Drama Team. Listen guys, we're so excited to be with y'all on July 15th, 7 p.m. It's only one night, but we know that God is going to do something amazing. So make plans to come because believe me, you don't want to miss it. July the 12th, 12 noon, we're all going to meet right here at Win First Assembly of God. We're going to, I've requested that we use the, the uh, gymnasium, and uh, it's got more room. It seems like we have more fun when we got more room and we spread out. But anyway, July the 12th at noon, and I'm asking you this time, bring a crock pot. Let's do it in a crock pot. It's easier. And I know everybody's got their favorite crock pot recipes. I'm going to bring mine, you bring yours, and we're going to call it crock pot luck. Pot luck in a crock pot. Crock pot luck. Sounds like a good name to me. See you July the 12th, 12 noon here at Win First Assembly in the uh, gymnasium, and bring your favorite crock pot lunch. And we're just going to have a, we're going to eat, and we're going to have a wonderful time. And pray for us. There's a possibility we're going to have a special speaker. Okay? We're working on it, and uh, I, believe, I believe it'll happen. Love you. See you there. Let's have a great time. Amen. Hey, church. It's Connor here with the Austin Drama Team. Listen, guys, we're so excited to be with y'all on July 15th, 7 p.m. It's only one night, but we know that God is going to do something amazing. So make plans to come because, believe me, you don't want to miss it. July the 12th, 12 noon, we're all going to meet right here at Win First Assembly of God. We're going to, I've requested that we use the, the uh, gymnasium, and uh, it's got more room. It seems like we have more fun when we got more room and we spread out. But anyway, July the 12th at noon, and I'm asking you this time, bring a crock pot. Let's do it in a crock pot. It's easier. And I know everybody's got their favorite crock pot recipes. I'm going to bring mine, you bring yours, and we're going to call it crock pot luck. Pot luck in a crock pot. Crock pot luck. Sounds like a good name to me. See you July the 12th, 12 noon here at Win First Assembly 
or in the uh, gymnasium and bring your favorite crock pot lunch. And we're just going to have a, we're going to eat and we're going to have a wonderful time. And pray for us. There's a possibility we're going to have a special speaker. Okay? We're working on it. And uh, I, believe, I believe it'll happen. Love you. See you there. Let's have a great time. Amen. Hey church, it's Connor here with the Austin Drama Team. Listen guys, we're so excited to be with y'all on July 15th, 7 p.m. It's only one night, but we know that God is going to do something amazing. So make plans to come because believe me, you don't want to miss it. See you. 
every praise is to our God. Uh, hallelujah. Psalms chapter 47, verse 1 says, Clap your hands, all peoples, and shout to God with loud songs of joy. Can we do that right now? Will you put your hands together and clap and shout some songs of joy to the Lord today? Lord, we worship you. We worship you, Lord. We worship you, Lord. Glory, 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 glory. We give you every praise in this house. We give you every praise in this house. Every praise is to our God, every word of worship with one accord, every praise, every praise is to our God. Sing it again. Every praise is to oh, our yes. God, every word of worship. Every praise is to our God. Every word of worship with one accord. Oh, yeah. Every praise, every praise is to our God. Come on, give him a hand clap one more time of praise. If he's healed your body, if he's saved your soul, if he's delivered you, that's something to praise him about. Amen. Amen. Well, if you're visiting with us today, God bless you for being in the house of the Lord. We want you to make yourself at home today so that you can have an encounter of, with God. Let's continue to worship the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords this morning. I raise a hallelujah in the presence of my enemies. Oh, I raise a hallelujah louder than the unbelief. I raise a hallelujah my weapon is a melody. Oh, I raise a hallelujah comes to fight for me. Oh, I'm gonna see in the middle of the storm. Louder and louder, you're gonna hear my praises roar. Up from the ashes, hope will arise. Death is defeated, the King is alive. the darkness flee. Oh, I raise a hallelujah in the middle of the mystery. Oh, I raise a hallelujah. Fear your lost 
you today, God. We thank you, God, for who you are, Jesus. King of kings, Lord of lords, comforter, one who carries us when we need you. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you for your mercy. Thank you for your grace. Thank you for your forgiveness. We love you. Jesus at the center of Jesus, you're the 
Addiction starts to break. Declaring there is hope and there is freedom. I speak Jesus. 
Because your name is power. Your name is healing. Your name is life. Break every stronghold. Shine through the shadows. Burn. just want to speak the name of Jesus over fear and all anxiety to every soul held captive by depression I speak Jesus cause your name is power your name is healing, your name is life. Break every stronghold, shine through the shadows, burn like a fire. Your name, your name is power, your name is healing. Your name is life. Break every stronghold, shine through the shadows, burn like a fire. Shout Jesus from the mountains, Jesus in the streets. Jesus in the darkness for every enemy. Jesus for my family, I speak the holy name of Jesus. Oh, shout Jesus from the mountains, Jesus in the streets. Jesus in the darkness over every enemy. Jesus for my family, I speak the holy name of Jesus. Your name, because your name is power. Your name is healing. Your name is Shine through the shadows, burn like a fire. Sing your name. Your name is power. Your name is healing. Your name is life. Break every stronghold. Shine through the shadows. Like a fire. And I just want to speak the name of Jesus over every heart and every mind. Because I know there is peace within his presence. I speak Jesus. Jesus from the mountains, Jesus in the streets, Jesus in the darkness over every enemy, Jesus for my family, I speak the holy name of Jesus, shout Jesus from the mountains, 
Jesus said the darkness over every enemy. Jesus, for my family, I speak the holy name of Jesus. Your name, because your name is power. Your name is healing. Your name is life. Break every stronghold. Shine through the shadows. More like a fire. Come on now. The scripture says that in my name you shall. In my name you shall. It's not a conditional thing. It is a fact. That when you invoke my name, you shall see these things take place. They shall lay hands. They shall lay hands on the sick. And they shall recover. They shall cast out demons in my name. They shall tread over scorpions. And they shall take up snakes. Now listen, we ain't going to take up no snakes in this house. Man, we ain't that kind of church. But if something comes across your way that's going to be detrimental to your well-being the bible says you shall in my name hear me today my friends we need to speak the name of jesus we need to speak the name of jesus we're going to sing this song a couple more times i ain't going to tell you going to do it one more time because i might tell them to do this and then i'll be lying but my friends i don't care what is going on in your life if fear is in your life speak jesus to it if anxiety is plaguing it uh, plaguing your heart and your mind speak jesus to it if your family is in a wreck today speak jesus to it because listen things take place when the name of jesus is invoked things take place when the name of jesus is invoked and we need to pull upon the name of Jesus today. We need to pull on that name today. And so we're going to sing this again. And my friends, I dare you, I double dog dare you to call upon the name of the Lord this morning. Hallelujah. Come on. Let's sing it again, Sarah. Jesus, I just want to speak His name. Come on, church. My God, my God, I speak Jesus, I speak Jesus, Jesus, I just want to speak the name of Jesus, hallelujah, till every dark addiction starts to break. Declaring there is hope and there is freedom. We speak Jesus. Yes, God. Your name is power. Your name is healing. Your name is life. Break every stronghold. Shine through shadows burn like a fire sing it again hallelujah and I just want to speak the name yes. of Jesus we want to speak that name over fear and all anxiety <laughs> to every soul held captive by depression, depression. I, speak I speak Jesus your name is power your name is healing your name is life drink every stronghold shine through the shadows burn like a fire Shout Jesus from the mountains, Jesus in the streets, Jesus in the darkness over every enemy, 
Jesus for my family, I speak the holy name, Jesus. Shout Jesus from the mountains, Jesus in the streets, Jesus in the darkness over every enemy. Jesus for my family, I speak the holy name, Jesus. Your name, your name is power, your name is healing, your name, your name is life, your name, strength every stronghold. Shine through the shadows when I could fall. Your name brings healing. Hallelujah. Your name is Yahweh. Your name is healing. Your name is life. Break every stronghold. Shine through the shadows. Burn like a fire. Come on now, church. I want you to lift up your hands towards heaven and just begin to speak the name of Jesus. Speak the name of Jesus right now over your circumstances in your life. Speak the name of Jesus over your sickness right now. Father, we speak Jesus over Kay right now. Touch her body. We speak healing. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. Lord, we speak... We speak Jesus over Shirley today. Touch her body. Bring healing in the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. We speak it right now over every life that is represented here. Let the healing power of Jesus fill this room. Strongholds come off in Jesus' name. Anxiety come off in Jesus' name. Fear come off in Jesus' name. Depression come off, melt off in Jesus' name. May a garment of praise be laid upon you instead of the spirit of heaviness. I speak Jesus over heaviness today. Heaviness in your mind. Heaviness in your body. Heaviness in your spirit. We speak Jesus to it right now. Glory to your name, Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. Aren't you thankful that we have a name to call upon today? Aren't you thankful? That's why the scripture says we can run to him because he is a strong tower for the righteous. He's a strong tower. He's the safety place. He is, he is the secret place which we need to run to that Psalms 91 talks about. I'm thankful that we can speak Jesus today. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Grab your neighbor's hand and let's pray for each other real quick. I just feel led to do that. Will you lift up your neighbor right now and speak Jesus over their life? Let the Holy Spirit guide you as you pray for them. Come on, Father, I lift up my neighbor to you. We lift up our neighbor to you, Lord. We speak Jesus over their life. We speak Jesus over their circumstance. We speak Jesus over every need that they may have in their lives. Bring healing. Bring restoration. Bring strength. Bring supernatural strength. Supernatural power. Supernatural favor. Divine favor. Oh God, open doors. Provide for them, oh God. Father, where their, their bank account is tight because of all of the inflation and gas prices, Lord, we pray for supernatural provision right now in Jesus' name. Thank you for my neighbor. Thank you for my brother. Thank you for my sister, oh God. Thank you for the church today. We glorify you. We exalt you. We extol you. We adore you today. Bless your holy name. Bless your holy name. Bless your holy name. Aren't you thankful for the church today? I am so thankful for the church. Amen, amen. Well, you may be seated if you can. I just want to emphasize a couple of announcements to you before we move on that there will be a service tonight. Our guest evangelist will be ministering to us again tonight at 6 o'clock. Make note of that. Come, bring a friend, bring your neighbor. 
Uh, it's going to be a fantastic, fantastic time in the Lord. Also, this Friday at 7 o'clock, we will be hosting the Allstate Drama Team. Uh, one of our own, Kaylee Johnson, is part of that group, and she's uh, going to be traveling with them all week. And so they'll be here Friday. Uh, you don't want to miss. We, ha we hosted them last year. And let me tell you something. Just because you hear the word drama, that doesn't mean that there won't be an anointing in the house. Okay? Because last time we hosted them, the Spirit of God was poured out in this place and prophetic utterances were being, we were being spoken over this church. And I believe they are just now becoming into fruition. And so you don't want to miss Friday night. Don't want to miss tonight. You don't want to miss Friday night. It's going to be an awesome time. Pray for Kaylee. She's going to be traveling with the Allstate Drama Team. Pray for Rachel. She's traveling with the Allstate Choir Team. Uh, and it's just going to be a fantastic week of ministry for them. And I'm so excited that our, our church is represented in both of those groups. And uh, it is a great honor to have them in our, in, in representing us in those ministries. Well, I am excited to, to release the pulpit to a friend of mine. Brother Ricky and Mindy were here last year. Uh, they ministered to us. And, man, let me tell you something. It was powerful. Uh, last Sunday, that Sunday night, he preached on the anointing. And uh, it was a powerful, powerful message. Uh, it's going to be a wonderful day in the Lord. We will be taking up a blessing uh, for him after the service this morning. But will you give Brother Ricky Salters another win, First Assembly? Welcome. Hallelujah. Love you, buddy. The scripture teaches us that God is omnipresent, which means he inhabits all time and space simultaneously. Uh, it also means that he inhabits the past, the present, and the future all at the same time. Uh, there are three things that God responds to. He responds to need. He responds to faith. And then he responds to atmosphere. If you have a need or you have faith, he'll respond to you individually. If we set an atmosphere, he responds to us corporately. If he responds to us corporately, even if you have a need and you're not making yourself available or you don't have the faith that you feel is necessary to get to him, the rest of us can create an atmosphere where he can move and everybody can find what they have need of. So you're not here today just for you. You're here for the person next to you. You're here for the person in the back you don't even know. You're here for the visitor that comes in. And our responsibility is to create such an atmosphere that no matter what the need is or what the situation is, God can have the freedom to operate the way that he desires to. So what I want you to do one more time, can you stand, lift your hands and your voices, and let's just create an atmosphere where the word of the Lord can go forth and God can have his way. Father, I pray that you would move in a mighty way this morning. Do a work like only you can, God. We open our hearts. We avail our minds. We ask you to touch us by your spirit. I pray that you would think your thoughts with my mind and speak your words with my mouth today and bring a word in due season for everyone that's here. Operate in a way that you desire to and help us to receive from you the word of life. And everybody said in Jesus' name. Why don't you take your Bible and go to 1 Peter chapter 5. I want to read just a few verses here. Thank you, Pastors Matthew and Stephanie Hodges, for having us again. Uh, last time when we were here, we brought half of our bunch with us, and uh, this time we are alone. Uh, so we have four kiddos and two grandbabies, and every now and then it's nice to just get off by ourselves. So we appreciate the opportunity. Uh, Matt, uh, First Peter chapter 5, and let's go to verse 5. We'll start reading at the second half of that section of the word of the Lord. God opposes the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. I want you to note the contrast there. Between the proud and the humble, there's opposition from God to the proud. There is grace or enablement to the humble. 
So in response to this, the writer says, humble yourselves. It's a lot better to humble yourselves than for God to have to humble you. Under the mighty power of God and at the right time, nudge your neighbor, say there's a time coming that is right. At the right time, he will lift you up in honor. Give all your worries and cares to God because he cares for you. Now, that verse 6 denotes a process for us where there is uh, an act of humility, there is an act of submission, and then there is a precise time where God begins to do a work. Verse 8 says, stay alert, watch out for your great enemy, the devil. He prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. Here's our admonition. Stand firm against him. Be strong in your faith. Remember that your family of believers all over the world is going through the same kind of suffering you are. Look at your neighbor and say, it's not just you. Verse 10, in his kindness, God called you to share, this speaks of partnership, in his eternal glory by means of Jesus Christ. So after you have suffered for a little while, he will restore you. He will support you and he will strengthen you and he will place you on a firm foundation because all power belongs to him forever and can the church say amen i've heard it said and said with much profundity that a picture is worth a thousand words but i believe it could be more aptly said that one word could probably paint at least a thousand different pictures Uh, if there is one word that can paint a detailed portrait of a reality of life that we can all identify with and empathize with and relate with, it's probably the word suffering. If we were to look to a dictionary to define the word suffering, we would find words that paint pictures of many of the current plight of many lives, words like pain, discomfort, hardship, distress, adversity, ruin, and affliction. Um, A thesaurus would add to the canvas of the portrait of suffering terms like betrayal. Am am I on anybody's street today? Loss, rejection, disease, divorce, calamity, misfortune, trials. And yet regardless of what definition currently fits your life or whatever those words have meant to you in your past situations, whether it's economical or familial or spiritual or vocational or even health related, there are two unalterable truths that scriptures teach us. Uh, The first thing that the scripture teaches is this, no one is void and no one is immune to suffering. The second thing the scripture teaches us is that no one goes through suffering without being altered or changed or transformed by that experience. Sometimes that's a good thing, and sometimes that's not such a good thing. But we're all changed by our suffering. Uh, In Deuteronomy 11, 11, as as God leads the people of, uh, uh, of, of Israel, the children of Israel, God's people, to the promised land, The first order of business that he lays out for them was the pattern for the promise that they were about to receive. And he tells them this, I'm going to take you to the promised land, but here's what I want you to know. It will be a land of mountains and valleys. It's going to be a land of highs and it's going to be a land of lows. It's going to be a land of successes, but it's also going to be a land of suffering. In fact, in Exodus 23 and 29, God says this, I will drive out the inhabitants before you. But get this, he says, but I will not do it all in one year. Because he said, if I allow you to progress too quickly, not only will you not be prepared for the land, the land won't be prepared for you. Now, if you get that in your spirit, that would be worth the dollar you put in the offering. 
that God said, I've got things prepared for you, but in order for me to give them to you and for you to get the most out of them, I've got to prepare the place for you and I've got to prepare you for the place. And the way that I will prepare you will be times of ups and downs and times of goods and bads and times of successes, but also times of suffering. God said the promise is yours but I'm allowing them to hold on to it for a season and I will use, somebody needs to get this, I will use your enemies to prepare the land for you so that when you get there everything I want to bless you with will already be prepared for you ahead of time. You may be here this morning and feel like God hasn't heard you and it seems like maybe he's ignoring your prayers. Anybody ever been there? You prayed and the heavens were brass and you couldn't get a word from God. You read your Bible and it didn't even make sense to you. But if you could see what this season of suffering is doing for you and in you, you would understand that it's all part of the process. It's all part of the plan. It's all part of the journey to where God is bringing me. God has somebody positioned and they're holding the job that He has for you. And when the time is right, He'll remove them and He'll put you in a place. Somebody might be living in the house God wants to give you. And He's going to give it to you, but they're in place taking care of your blessing until you're ready to manage and handle what God wants to give you. We all want the blessing, but most of us don't want to go through what it takes to be able to handle and manage the blessing wisely. Y'all here this morning? It'd be a lot better if we just shout and roll around and fall out. But when somebody comes to us and tells us that God's got a journey of discipline and ups and downs and learning and process so that we can become in character and in His likeness everything that He needs us to be so that we can handle the magnitude of the blessing that He wants to give us, all of a sudden we back up. Can I tell you that God has more for you than you ever imagined. He has more for this church than you can ever conceptualize in your mind. He has greater things in store. But the thing that's the most important is that you and I are able to handle what God wants to give us. God may have them holding your promise for a while just until you're ready to manage it. Now, I've already... Uh, preached the entirety of my message in just a few minutes but, but if by revelation of the Holy Spirit you could get a hold of this concept we, we could shout a little bit and go home and you'd walk in victory regardless of the season of suffering because you'd know this is all in the plan of God you'd know this is all in the purpose of God but see we have a problem called the carnal mind and it can't understand the spiritual ways of God. So if you'll indulge me just for a few minutes this morning, I want to preach to you a little bit and stretch your faith because God has more for you. Nudge your neighbor and say, God has more for you. I want you to get this. The season of suffering is certain, but it is not the end of your story. It's not where it ends. Suffering almost always precedes success. There's a purpose for the way God brings us to and through success. The scripture records this for our understanding, and it's what we read in 1 Peter chapter 5, verses 5-11, through 11, that part of God's plan to help us walk in the destiny He has called us to is the preparation that is necessary to get us to a place in character and maturity where we can handle everything God has for us. And I want you to hear me this morning, the catalyst of character that God has for building us the most seems to be seasons of suffering. Jesus came to do two specific things for us. Number one, he came to show us what God looks like in human form. If you want to see how God acts and how God reacts, what God loves and what God hates, what he values and what he desires, then look no further than Jesus. Jesus is the reflection of God in flesh. Jesus is God manifest in the flesh. Jesus is the visible picture of the invisible God. But the second thing that Jesus came to do is this. He came to reveal to us and demonstrate for us what it looks like to be human in a way that honors God. Now we've already established the fact that we all suffer. 
But the question we've got to address as believers is how does that honor God? The honor of suffering is wrapped up in what it does in us and what it does for us and what it does through us. So I want to take just a closer look at Jesus and his suffering. Isaiah 53 and 3 says this, that Jesus was known as a man of sorrows and suffering. In Mark 8 and 31, the Bible tells us that he is known as the son of of suffering. I, I want you to get the connection with sonship and suffering. Otherwise, when times are bad and you're besieged by trouble and suffering is all around you, you will equate your difficulties with abandonment from God and disassociation from the Father. One of the greatest tools the enemy has is to question your sonship when times are difficult. Because if he can rob you of your belief and get you to doubt and disbelieve the, the paternal connection that you have with God, He can rob you of access to your birthright and your authority and your power. And every time you hit a roadblock, every time something bad happens, every time you perceive something is difficult, He'll throw into your mind, well, well God must not be for me. Maybe God's not on my side anymore. I came to church and I couldn't feel him. I prayed last week and he didn't answer. And the, the, the enemy will assault your mind with feelings that you have been disassociated from the Father and you've been abandoned by God. <clears throat> but I want you to look at Jesus as our example again. In Matthew 4 and 6, Jesus says during a time of wilderness suffering, he says to Jesus, if you are the Son of God, While Jesus is hungry and fasting, while Jesus is thirsting without water, while Jesus is in the wilderness of trial and testing, the enemy comes to him and says, If you really are the Son of God, why is all this happening? I want you to contrast that with God's view of suffering and success and how they are interwoven on the journey of destiny. Hebrews 5 and 8 says this about Jesus. He learned, that denotes process, he learned obedience by the things that he suffered. Are you ready for this? Because he was a son. Sonship led him to suffering. But suffering was the gateway to success. It was the pathway to promise and it was the process for progress. Just because things aren't going right, just because things are against you, just because you're in the midst of a tumultuous time, doesn't mean God has forsaken you, doesn't mean God has disassociated himself from you, doesn't mean he has turned his back on you more than anything. It probably means that you're a true son of God, you're a true daughter of God, God is on your side, God is walking beside you, God is all around you, and he's taken you to a place greater than anything you could have imagined. That's not the time to throw in the towel that's the time to push on ahead and say if God is for me who can be against me despite what hell's doing to me despite what the world has got around me and despite what I'm going through God is still on my side now that, that's that's shouting material unless you're presently in the season of suffering you ever read the book of Job? I, when, I, when things aren't going right and I feel really bad, I read the book of Job because it makes me feel better. And we all get excited about how God was with Job in the trial. And when he came out of the trial, despite losing everything, he got blessed double for his trouble. And if you preach that in a Pentecostal church and especially use that phrase, double for your trouble, everybody shouts and dance and Runs around, look like a track meeting. We all get excited. But, but, but here's the key. The reason why we can celebrate is because we're on the backside of Job's trial and we know he's going to make it. We know he's going to come through and we know that God is in the midst of it all. But when Job was in the trial, he didn't know any of that. 
And when you're in the trial, sometimes you don't know if you're going to make it. Sometimes you feel like you're going to uh, uh, falter and fail. Sometimes you feel like you're never going to get out of it. But I want to preach to you today that you've got to understand that even though I'm in a season of suffering, I'm here now, but I'm not going to die here. I'm not going to stop here. I'm not going to stay here. I'm not going to give up here. There is a purpose for this season. And if I can endure the season, I will see the success. And so if you're in that season I want to spend the next few minutes preaching to you There is a word for your time in the fire And it's this Suffering stretches the soul Suffering creates an elasticity That accommodates a volume of anointing That you can't get any other way I've been in ministry almost 30 years, a little more than 30 years. And, and what I found is that men and women who are greatly anointed have experienced seasons of great suffering. Men and women who are greatly effective in ministry are men and women who have experienced some great trials. If you read your Bible from Genesis to Revelation, you will find men and women who did great things for God and who were used mightily by God went through seasons of suffering. And pain and turmoil and trial. Some of it happened when they were young. Sometimes they were older when it happened. But despite it all, everybody went through some suffering. But in the midst of it all, it created a volume for anointing that could not be obtained any other way. And when they came out of their season of suffering, there was a power upon them that affect everybody they came in contact with. I want you to hear this word this morning. The same fire that melts wax... Hardens clay, but it purifies gold. And so it is with suffering. It's not a matter of if you will suffer. It's a matter of when you will suffer. And the greater question is how you will suffer. How will you respond in the midst of it all? The process is not always about what suffering does for us as much as it is about what suffering does in us. Suffering challenges and develops our faith. If you're taking notes, write this down. A faith that cannot be tested is a faith that cannot be trusted. If your faith can't sustain you in the fire, it's not going to sustain you while everything is good. Anybody can come to church and dance and huck a butt and run around and jerk and gyrate when everything's good and you got plenty of money in the bank and your kids are acting great and your marriage is fine and your job is rosy. But when all hell's breaking loose and your kids are acting crazy and you broke as Job's turkey and can't rub two pennies together and everything's falling down around your ears, it takes a faith that has been tried in the fires of affliction to be able to stand in the midst of that and say though he slay me yet will I serve him if God's on my side I can make it through this there is something about a faith that has been tried and tested that you can hold on to when times are tough suffering creates a stability in hard times that demands we focus on the Savior instead of the storm It demands that we learn to focus on the giver and not the gifts. It demands that we focus on the plan instead of the pain. Y'all still with me? Suffering is progressive in its purpose. It takes us incrementally into our promise so that as we go, we grow. So that the more we endure and the more we encounter and the more we go through, the the greater the anointing, the more trust God can place upon us and the greater blessing He can can funnel into our lives. The journey teaches us this, that if God did this on a small level, He can do this on a larger level. If God took me through that, He can take me through this. If God saved me through that, He can save me through this. And then the flip side of that is we get a testimony to go to somebody else. And instead of just saying, I've heard God can do it, we can say, I've been there and I can tell you God can do it. I survived the experience and I know for a fact that if He did it for me, He can do it for you. And so we go from faith to faith and from glory to glory and from a trial to a testimony. This is why 
David was a shepherd killing lions and bears before he faced a giant. And why he faced a giant before he led a nation. And why he led 600 men who were misfits and behind on taxes and, and in trouble with the state before he ever led 600 mighty men who were full of authority and power. There was a transitionary period where he grew as he went. And here's the victory in suffering. God doesn't send suffering, but he does sanctify it. You know the story of Job. He's having all hell break loose. And his friends come to him to encourage him. And they say things like, well, Job, have you been sinning? One of them said, Job, have you had your eyes on handmaidens? They, they, they were questioning his morality. They were questioning his integrity. They were questioning his spirituality. And in the midst of it all, it, it was the enemy that was trying to destroy him, but God was sanctifying what the enemy had sent to destroy him, and he turned it into something that would bless him in the end. Don't let people, especially church people, put their hand on your shoulder and pat you on the back and tell you it's your fault because you're in the midst of a trial. It may be your fault, but in the midst of it, God will teach you something. But many times it's not your fault. It's the enemy has come to assault you, but God will sanctify you in the midst of suffering, and he will sanctify the process, and he will do a work inside of you that when you come out of it, you'll be able to give glory in a place where you should have been destroyed. As soon as we understand the progress of suffering that leads to success and sonship, our suffering becomes cultivating and creative. And when we face one of the myriad ways that it, that it touches uh, this thing called life, Rather than defeating and destroying us, it becomes a tool that God uses to deepen our character and to create opportunities for us to thrive during tumultuous times and to showcase our faith for the world who is watching us. Nudge your neighbor and say, there's a sermon in your scars. And when we come out of our suffering, it's not just that we have sustained faith. It's that we have sufficient faith. We have mature faith. We have unshakable faith. So, so how does this word apply to us? Let, let me give you three questions you need to learn to ask yourself during processes of suffering. The first question is, what is this revealing? Start looking at patterns. I told somebody the other day, I don't believe what I, what I see and I don't believe what I hear. I believe the patterns that show up. So in suffering, ask yourself, what is this revealing about me? What patterns am I seeing revealed? There are some patterns of behavior that will never be broken until you experience pain. You go broke enough times, you'll start scratching your head saying, I might need to change the way I'm handling money. You ever had this happen, Pastor? I'm sure you have. People come to you and say, my God, Pastor, could you pray that God would bless me financially because I need money? And I used to, you know, lay hands on them, oil them up, and talk in tongues and shiver and quake and fall out. And, and then after I'd pastored a few years, um, they would come and say, could you pray for me that God would bless me, send me money, let me win the lottery? And, and I'd just say, no. And they say, why not? And i say, well, but, but because it's not a spiritual problem. It's a, it's a spending problem. And I can pray all day long, but until you quit spending... God's not going to give you any more money because you just spend it. We give you a million dollars and next week you'd be broke because it's not a spiritual problem. It's a spending problem. So here's, here's your solution. You can either spend less or you can make more. We, we don't have to pray and talk in tongues and have interpretation and all that kind of business. We just see a pattern and sometimes the pain of a pattern makes us stop and say, what do I need to do differently? I was complaining when we got here because I was trying on my suit. And, and I, I'm, my shirt's too tight and, and my pants are too tight and my jacket's too tight. And I'm standing in front of the mirror and I said, I'm fat, baby. And she said, it's because you drink too many Cokes and eat too many peanut M&Ms. 
So don't complain. Either quit eating the stuff that makes you fat or go buy bigger clothes. We didn't have to have a prayer meeting. We didn't have to call Pastor Hodges and say, we... Are you getting what I'm saying? I tell my, my children, I, uh, they're almost all out of the house now. I got one left still at home. But, but I tell my children, if, if there's drama in relationships and you're always in it, you might be the problem. You're the common denominator. Sometimes pain causes us to step back and find out there's a pattern going on. Uh, my, my, my oldest son said one time when he was much younger, I, I don't know how it works, but he said, uh, when I study a lot, I make good grades. <laughs> when I don't study a lot, I don't make good grades. So, so sometimes it's a matter of going through a process that reveals patterns and it causes some pain and we say, I need to change. Uh, when, I, when, I'm, when, I'm, when I'm nice to my spouse, it, it, my, my life seems to go better. When I come to church, I seem to be more positive. When I worship God, I seem to have more freedom. When I give liberally and generously, I seem to get the blessing of the Lord. Sometimes God will allow us to go through a process of suffering and pain so that we can recognize the patterns in our life that need to be broken. Second thing you've got to ask yourself is, what is this teaching me? This is too practical for Pentecostal churches because we just like to shout. I love to shout. But sometimes we need some application. What is this teaching me? Where can I apply the truth that I'm learning? If I preach to you and all it does is make you feel good, but you leave. This used to happen when I was traveling all over the country. I've heard guys say, oh, my God, we had a, I'd call my friends. How'd church go tonight? Oh, we had a move of God. What did the pastor preach about? I don't know, but we had a move of God. We just missed the whole purpose for being there. To get a word that you can apply on Monday morning. I, we need to shout on Sunday. We need an atmosphere on Sunday. We need the glory of God on Sunday. But can I tell you this? We need some application on Monday and on Tuesday and on Wednesday. What is this teaching me? How can I apply it? Where do I put it to use in my life? Don't pray for deliverance. Pray for development. Here's what happens. We get in a, How much time I got left? We get in a situation, pressure's on, we're suffering, and we say, God, deliver me out of this. And God is good because he'll answer your prayer. He picks you up, puts you down, set your feet on solid ground, you shout a little bit on Sunday, jump down, turn around, touch the ground, say amen, all that kind of business. And six months later, you find yourself right back in the same situation. You say, God, I thought you delivered me from this. And he says, I did. But you didn't learn the lesson that you needed to learn, so you're back in it again. And you'll keep going back to it over and over again until you learn the lesson that you need to learn. What do I need to learn here? What, what declivities in my, in my character are being revealed that I need to work on? Where do I need to develop? And then the third question you've got to ask yourself is, where is this taking me? Don't curse your crisis. It's taking you where you want to go. It's taking you where God's designed for you to be. It's not about what I'm going through. It's about where I'm going to. The season of suffering is the vehicle. It's not the end. God's not, God's not whipping me. God is equipping me so that I can be more than I've ever been, so that I can do more than I've ever done, so that God can get glory in the end of it all. Now let me just spend a minute dealing with the frustration of suffering. Y'all give me just a few more minutes. The frustration during suffering is that God is always the quietest when the trials are the hardest. Anybody say amen to that? It, my wife and sister Stephanie are educators. And this is what I've discovered. When you're in the test, the teacher never talks. She's there. She just don't have anything to say. Why? Because she already taught the material to the best of her ability and she believes that because she taught the material to the best of her ability, she has given you all of the qualifications that you need to pass the test. She's not given you the test 
so that you can fail. She's not hoping that you'll fail. She's giving you the test with confidence. I taught you what you needed to know. Now I'm going to give you the the test and I believe you're going to pass it in such a way that when you're done, I can reward you openly and publicly for the passing of the test that I've put you through. God in His quietness is not rejecting you or walking away from you. God in His quietness is saying to you, I am confident that you're going to make it through this. I believe you're going to make it through this. I have taught you well. I've given you everything that you need. And when you come out of this, I'm going to reward you openly and publicly. And everybody's going to know that it is the test that situated you in the place of blessing. There's a message in God's silence. Isaiah 46 and 10. I'm going to have to come back sometime and preach this. Uh, uh, God declares the end from the beginning. When He calls a thing into existence, He calls it as a completed process. He calls it as the finished product. He calls it as the end success. But here's the kicker. Although He declares from the end, He builds from the beginning. So God gives you this beautiful picture of the end, of what it's going to be, of how glorious it's going to be, how wonderful it's going to be. And then you look around you and you're standing at the beginning and it don't look anything like that. And you're measuring where you're at with where God has assigned you. And you forget that He's creating you to be what he's already declared you. And so your goal is not to get frustrated. Your goal is to look at where you are and say, it don't look like that yet, so I'm going to keep trying. It don't look like that yet, but I'm going to keep believing. It don't look like that yet, but I'm going to keep on trusting God. It don't look. It looks a little more like it, but it's not there yet. I look a, li- a little more like it, but I'm not there yet. I'm not going to give up. I'm not going to stop. I'm going to keep believing. I'm going to keep putting one foot in front of the other. The steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord, is what Psalm 37 and 23 said. Not the miles, not the ways, but the steps. If God can take care of this step, He can take care of that step. And if he can take care of that step, he can take care of the next step. All I've got to do is trust him one step at a time to get from where I'm at to where I'm going to become everything that he's already showed me I'm going to be. In God's mind, this church is already full. In God's mind, this church is overflowing. In God's mind, the altars are full and people are getting saved. Has it happened yet? No. But you know what? We're heading in that direction. We're going to keep believing. We're going to keep trusting. And we're going to keep doing what we need to do to become what he's shown us we already are. I'm going to be honest with you here. I grew up watching professional wrestling. And sometimes when I'm watching TV, it comes on and I'm just... And I still watch it. I know it's staged. But when I was younger, I noticed something. That the two guys in the ring would be wrestling and fighting. The crowd would be going crazy. Everybody's rooting for somebody. Everybody's screaming, hollering. There'd be some guy sitting over the table like this. He's not excited. He's not wondering who's going to win. He's not anxious at all. He's not cheering. You know why? He's the guy they call the booker. He's the guy that just a few minutes before the match started met with two wrestlers in the back and said, here's what we're going to do. We're going to wrestle for 15 minutes. Here's the moves you're going to pull off. You're going to win. You're going to lose. That's why he's not excited. He already knows the end of the match. That's why he's not cheering, because it doesn't matter. He already knows. He already set it up. Can I tell you that while you're all frustrated and bent out of shape and wondering how it's going to happen, God's not anxious. God's just sitting on the sideline like this. Because he already booked the match. He already knows who's going to win. He already knows in the end you're coming out on top. He already knows when it comes to the very end of things, you're going to be a success. And everything he's declared you're going to be, you're going to be in the end. Psalm 105.19 said, Until the word came to pass, it tried Joseph. 
In other words, it put him on the stand. It questioned if he really was what God said. Every time something went wrong in Joseph's life, the prophetic word of what he was going to become said to him, Are you really this? Every time he got betrayed, the prophetic word came to uh, 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 Joseph and said, Are you really this? Did God really say? Are you sure it wasn't just you? Through betrayal, through loss, through being in prison, being thrown in the pit... It questioned him about his current situation until finally it proved him. But the process of pain and the season of suffering had to teach and discipline and mature him until it could prove him. I want to tell you today, God believes in you. The silence proves it and the suffering is going to prove you. If you remove the pain and the suffering that favor caused... Factor out the betrayal of those who should have been his protectors. If you take away being thrown in the pit by familial jealousy and the prison he set in after false accusations on his character, you take all that away from Joseph. And I'm going to tell you what you've got. You've got a loud mouth, spoiled, overindulged, coddled little boy, a daddy's boy. Who's got a physical coat he likes to brag about and doesn't have the character to do anything with what he could have. But let the years grind on his ego. Let him finally recognize that his circumstances are beyond his control. Then let, 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 uh, let him watch God elevate him without anybody else pulling the strings of his destiny. Only to be forgotten in the prison. Even after operating in the gifts to help others. Let his heart be crushed. Let his dreams be trampled on. And watch as the process begins to soften his heart. And his pain humbles his spirit. And you have a man that develops a grace within him that he never had in his younger years. And by the time he's elevated to a place in the palace where he can finally get revenge and recompense on those that cost him the years of his life. And you'll see a man of character in a full stature of maturity who's been so purified by the process that revenge and vengeance for the injustices that he suffered doesn't even matter anymore. And he becomes the savior of those who sought to destroy him. And he does so willingly. And he looks them in the eye and says, but as for you, you meant it for evil. But God meant it for good. And he becomes the prime minister of a nation. And he helps those that tried to destroy him. When I was a little kid, I used to spend the night at my my big granny's house. We had little granny and big granny. We were real original. Big granny lived in a little wood frame house in Wiley, Texas. We'd go over there almost every weekend and spend the night. I never knew my grandfather on that side. He died when my mom was about 16. But I loved Big Granny. And she'd take care of us while we were there. Little two-room house. Uh, We'd sleep on the couch. She slept in one bedroom. And I'd go in that other bedroom because she'd tell me not to. I'd go in that other bedroom. And I'd look. And she had this crazy-looking contraption hanging. Took up the whole room. Threads and material and sewing equipment, all kind of business. Didn't look like anything to me but a mess. I say, Big Granny, what's going on in here? What is this? She said, Ricky, I'm making a quilt. A quilt? Don't look like no quilt to me. Bunch of threads and material, some fluffy looking stuff. I don't know how you get a quilt out of all that. I'd come over a few weeks later, walk back in that room. It'd look even worse. Big Granny, what you do? I'm making a quilt. All right. And then a few weeks later, I'd walk in, and she'd say, let me show you something. We'd go back in the room, and she would take this mess of material and stuffing and threads, and she would flip it over. And I would see a beautiful pattern all put together. 
a design that she had created. But it didn't look like that when I was standing on the backside of it. It didn't look like that until the, the master creator flipped it over to show what she had been designing on the front side that you couldn't see while you were staring at the back side. Can I tell you, suffering is a lot like putting a quilt together. There's a lot of random threads and there's a lot of random material and it doesn't make sense. And if you're looking from the wrong perspective, you'll never figure it out. And you'll think God doesn't have anything planned and you'll think your life is wasted. But if you'll give God the reins of your life, one of these days, He's going to flip it all over and show you that He is the God of random threads. And He is a God that had it all designed all along. He was the God that was putting together a pattern. You just hadn't reached the right time yet you just hadn't reached the right place yet but when God's timing is right he's going to flip the thing and you're going to see that after you have suffered for a while he's going to stabilize you and he's going to build you up and he's going to lift you up and in due season he's going to elevate you to a place where he can glory through you in a mighty way <coughs> suffering is the random threads of destiny. If our musicians could come. It never makes sense now. And I've come to you with a prophetic word to tell you that soon. Soon God is going to show up in a way you never expected. And He's going to do for you what you could not do for yourself. have time to go through all this but Isaiah 63 verse 1 a few verses there it says this who is this that comes from Edom riding in the greatness of his strength whose clothes are dipped in blood and the writer responds then to his own question as the voice of God saying it's me I'm coming from Edom riding in the greatness of my strength not mighty to save. And then he says this, I have trodden the winepress alone. And there was none to help me. If you study that out a little bit, you'll find that Edom is the enemies of God. And the writer is in the midst of a, of, a, of a troublesome time when the enemy is all about him. And he, he feels defeated and he thinks there's no way out. And then he sees somebody coming from the enemy's camp. And all he can see is this guy's on a horse and he's got garments that look like they've been dipped in blood. And all he's thinking is, it's got to be the enemy coming and I'm done for. And as he peers through spiritual eyes and he gets clarity and vision, he realizes it's not the enemy at all. It's God coming from the enemy's camp. And his garments are dipped in blood. And God says this, I have treaden the wine press alone. It's a, it's a picture of, of during that time, it's a, a, a Hebraic idiomatic expression, which is an expression that's indigenous to the culture. In other words, if I said to you, so-and-so kick the bucket, you would know what I meant. They ain't with us no more. But if you said that overseas, so-and-so kick the bucket, they're going to think somebody kicked a bucket. Okay? So this expression, I have trodden the wine press alone is a picture of somebody standing in a, in a vat full of grapes to make wine and they're stomping. And the juice is splashing up all over their clothes until their clothes are covered in wine juice. And the writer said when, when this writer showed up from the enemy's camp, it looked like he'd been stomping in juice because it was all, blood was all over him. He had been slaughtering somebody. And the point of the story is this, that, that while the writer was writing about the difficult situation he was in, he didn't even know it, but God was over here in the enemy's camp taking care of stuff that the writer didn't even know he was doing. And he says, I have trodden the wine press alone, and there was none to help me. 
Can I just tell you that there's a certain place, I don't know who this is for, but I feel the Holy Ghost right now. There's a certain point in your season of suffering where you've done all you can do. You've prayed your prayers. You've been faithful to church. You've given. You've celebrated. You've held on to faith. You've walked through the journey. There comes a time when you have done all you can do. And God comes out of nowhere and says, I'm going to take care of this myself. In fact, that, that word, if you study that out in, in Hebrew, when he says that he, he was at the enemy's camp, uh, it, it actually says, it, it, the term used is, is the term backstabber. Which means a backstabber, somebody goes behind your back and does stuff you don't even know they're doing. God said, watch this. While you're over there fretting and worrying and confused and frustrated and all that, I'm not even going to tell you what I'm going to do. I'm going to go behind your back and I'm going to defeat the enemy by myself. And you're not even going to know I'm doing it until I'm finished. Can I tell you this? That there is a place you can reach in your season of suffering where God doesn't need your faith. God doesn't need your prayers. God doesn't need your help. But in the midst of it all, He comes in and says, watch this. You just keep on wondering what's happening. I'm going to go over here to the enemy's camp and I'm going to destroy everything that's set out to, to fight you. I'm going to defeat everything that you thought was coming against you. I'm going to take authority over everything that you thought was going to cost you your victory. And I am going to do it all by myself. And when I come back you're going to wonder how in the world it happened how did I get blessed out of that situation how did I get a raise out of that job how did I get a blessing out of that person how did I come to this place I'm going to tell you how because God's going to go behind your back and fight your battles for you he's going to take care of situations you didn't even know he was taking care of and he's going to flip the script and you're going to say oh it all makes sense now I want you to stand to your feet. I don't know who you are or what you're going through. But if this word is for you, I want you to just lift your hands right there where you're sitting. You've been in a season of suffering. You've been praying prayers and you feel like they hadn't been answered. You've been asking God questions, but you hadn't heard any answers. But God sent me all the way from Dallas, Texas to give you a word to tell you. He not only knows where you're at, He knows exactly what He's doing with your life, and He has an appointed time on His calendar of destiny when He's going to step into your situation, and He is going to fight your battles for you. And all you're going to be able to do is stand back wide-eyed looking. I don't know if y'all have altar calls around here anymore, but I come from a, from a, a, a history of, of, of altar calls. Here's what I want you to do. I want you to grab the hand of somebody next to you or somebody that you know is going through a trial. Y'all looking at me real funny. And here's what I want. As a defiant act to the situation of suffering that you're in, I want you to say, I refuse to sit back here in my seat. I'm going to grab the hand of somebody for some support. We're going to walk down here to the front. We're going to lift our hands to Jesus together and we're going to celebrate the fact that this is not over. We are not at the end. We're not going down. We're going up. We're not going to fail or falter. We are going to find victory and God is going to do something great for us. And then instead of just thinking about your situation, I want you to think about the circumstances and the situations of the people around you. And I want you to begin to pray for them that they will stay strong in the midst of suffering, that they will stay strong in the midst of the trial, and that God will move for them. In a Would you do that for me? Would you just grab somebody, husbands, grab your wives, or grab a friend, and just walk down here to the front? And I, and I want you to see what God will begin to do when you begin to celebrate together, and you begin to worship together, and you begin to walk in victory together. Come on, God's on your side. God's got your back. God is fighting for you. God is fighting with you. Oh, that's beautiful. That's beautiful. That's beautiful. Come on, let's sing unto the Lord.
just want to speak the name of Jesus over every heart and every mind. Because I know there is peace within your presence. I speak Jesus. I just want to speak the name of Jesus. Till every dark addiction starts to break. Declaring there is hope and there is freedom. I speak Jesus. Cause I know 
there is peace within his presence. I speak Jesus. Shout Jesus. And shout Jesus from the mountains. Jesus in the streets. Jesus in the darkness over every enemy. Jesus for my family, I speak the holy name of Jesus. And shout Jesus from the mountains, Jesus in the streets, Jesus in the darkness over every enemy. Jesus for my family, I speak the holy name of Jesus. Shout Jesus. Shout Jesus from the mountains. Jesus in the streets. Jesus in the darkness over every enemy. Jesus for my family, I speak the holy name of Jesus. Hallelujah. Boy, doesn't that give you a different perspective of suffering, of what you're going through? What a word. What a word. Brother Ricky, I think I might watch that again this week sometime. Man, praise the Lord. I'm going to ask our ushers to come forward. Pastor Adam got us some ushers. I want to give you an opportunity to bless Brother Ricky and Sister Mindy. They have taken times that they're busy to get. They they both work and they've they've driven from Dallas to win. And how many knows that's not a a cheap task in itself? I want us to bless them. They'll be, again, they'll be here again tonight, so I want to encourage you to invite somebody to come with you tonight. Say, so listen, there's, there's a word for you, and you need to hear that word, and get them here. If you have to say, listen, I'll take you to Johnson's and buy you bacon, fried, deep fried bacon, whatever it's called, chicken fried bacon, I'll buy it for you if you'll just come to church. But I want to pray. If you're making a check, make it out to the to the church, and at the end of the night tonight, we'll we'll cut one check for Brother Ricky. But thank you for your faithfulness and your generosity in giving, Father. We thank you for the man of God that you sent for this day. The word and what she spoken already, and the word that he will speak tonight, I know, will be seasoned with anointing. But Lord, help us now to be a blessing to the man of God and the woman of God that you've sent for this hour. I pray that you would help us to meet their needs. Lord, you know what tomorrow holds for them. And I pray that you would help us to be a little bit part of that blessing. And we thank you for that right now in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. God bless you as you give. If you will, stand with me across this auditorium. Again, we'll be back here tonight at 6. Don't miss. You don't want to miss. 
Because you know what happens when you miss? God shows up. Happens every time. So don't miss. Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for this word. May we hold it to our hearts. May it remind us constantly that you've got things in your hand. And everything's going to be okay. Go with us this afternoon. Give us rest in our body, in our mind, in our spirit. Bring us back tonight so that we can worship you in spirit and truth. We love you, Lord, and we give you praise and glory and honor. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. God bless you. Get around to our evangelists. Let them know how much his word meant to you today. God bless you.